Welcome everyone to this afternoon's webinar, um, Moral Robots and Ethical AI, with panelists Professor Nigel Crook and Dr. Matthias Rolf. It's going to be chaired this afternoon by the Oxford chapter member Ella Barrington, who's a project manage manager and also an associate lecturer in the School of Engineering, Computing and Maths. Welcome all. I'll hand you over to Ella. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as Molly said, my name is Ella Barrington. Uh, I am an alumni of this very great university and for the privilege they have invited me back and I um, now teach on the MSc uh, that I came to in 2007-2008. And why I'm here with you today is to, uh, as a member of the Oxford alumni chapter, so we're a relatively new group and we are based uh, in Oxford quite clearly from our title but we're a really diverse group and we are hoping to run lots more of these events across 2021 and 2022 hopefully some in 3D form as well as coming at you over the internet so if anybody is still in the Oxford area and would like to join us please don't hesitate to contact us we're online we're on LinkedIn um, we'd love to hear from you and to, to really get the conversation going about the wonderful things our alumni are still doing in Oxford and surrounding areas so I am joined tonight as Molly said by Professor Nigel Crook and Matthias Rolf so Nigel is the Associate Dean for Research and Knowledge Exchange and a Professor of AI and Robotics his research interests include machine learning, embodied conversational agents, social robotics, and autonomous moral machines. He has over 30 years of experience as a lecturer and a researcher in AI. Nigel graduated from Lancaster University with a BSc Honours in Computing and Philosophy and has awarded his PhD from Oxford, University, uh, Oxford Brookes University in Explainable AI in 1991. We've also got Matthias Rolf with us. He is a senior lecturer in AI and computing over with us in the School of Engineering, Computing and Maths. He has published over 40 peer reviewed articles on AI and machine learning. His most significant and award winning research investigates infant learning inspired algorithms for robot learning. Matthias previously held a position as specially appointed assistant professor at Osaka University, Japan and he received his PhD with highest honours from Bielefeld University in Germany in 2012. So Nigel and Matthias regularly collaborate on processes which control ethics and morals of machines driven by AI, which is what we're going to be discussing today. First, I'd just like to hand over to Nigel, who will tell us a little bit more about the work that they're doing over in the Institute for Ethical AI. Over to you, Nigel. Thanks, Ella. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction and thank you also for inviting us to take part in this event. I'm delighted to be here and to share this with you and always keen to talk about um, our research. Um, I, I was asked just to give a, a brief introduction to the Institute for Ethical AI at Oxford Brookes University, um, which was launched last year uh, officially. Um, and the the reason is that this connects to the work that we'll be talking about in our discussion later about moral machines that actually arose out of that work uh, uh, as a result of our interest in ethics. Um, so uh, the Institute for Ethical AI it is a university-based in institute. Um, our mission is to uh, promote the ethical development and deployment of AI technologies. Um, and we focus very much on a hands-on way of doing this. Uh, we are really keen to help organisations that genuinely want to benefit from AI and data analysis within their business. Uh, and we want to do that in a very practical way. Uh, as I think probably most people on this uh, seminar would know, AI offers uh, businesses and organisations a huge number of opportunities um, for uh, uh, helping their business, uh, ranging from 
um, supporting business decisions and, and uh, improving market intelligence to uh, even recruiting staff in the HR sector. Uh, and we want to be able to maximize, help businesses maximize those opportunities whilst also being aware of the risks that AI poses. And I think everybody is probably aware of those risks by now. It's been very public um, debate about it. And for a business or an organization, there are various risks that they could face, brand issues, um, possible liability issues, security, accountability, and so on. Uh, and in order to do this, what we've done is uh, brought together uh, a wide range of academics and uh, people with business knowledge um, uh, that, that can bring their expertise to bear on, on AI solutions for businesses and organizations. Um, it's not just about the technology. Um, we knew from the start it wasn't just about the technology. Um, we have to provide a service to organizations that understands business. We need people on our team to, that understand business, that understand the social impact of AI. Um, so we've recruited from a, across the university a wide range of people with um, both technical uh, skills, uh, but also social science, business skills and so on, in order to help us to support organizations in their use of AI. Um, we spent a long time listening to businesses, about two years before we did the formal launch last year, actually listening to organizations, trying to understand uh, what their concerns were uh, in the use of AI uh, uh, technology within their business. Um, and that has allowed us to identify a range of services and products that we can uh, offer that ranges from uh, helping businesses on board AI and to comply with standards and, and protocols. Uh, it includes validation uh, and evaluation of AI products from the point of view of the, uh, not just the um, manufacturer, the producer of the, the AI product, but also the, the purchaser uh, and, and the people who are impacted by the use of that AI product. And of course, we we are uh, engaged in uh, academic research in this area, and that that can be useful to uh, organisations too. Um, so a number of services we've offered uh, already and are offering to companies. Um, just to give you an example, some of the innovations work we've been doing. We've got an innovation team that are helping companies, large and small to uh, deal with the challenges of onboarding AI. Uh, and there are two uh, examples that I want to briefly share with you. One is um, uh, a, pl a platform, a service um, uh, product, I suppose you'd call it, that we are um, uh, developing, which enables um, businesses to um, connect different AI uh, applications to their data without having to reconfigure their data to fit the application. So essentially what we're providing is the sandwich in between the application that needs the data and the organization that owns the data. Uh, and that, that's currently under development uh, and being evaluated. Uh, and the other thing that we're doing is uh, developing a virtual incubator, which is an online uh, facility for enabling us to get alongside businesses and organizations of all kinds, um, helping them with the challenges of uh, integrating AI safely and ethically into their organization. So that's just a quick flavor. I don't, didn't really want to dwell on it too much, but I wanted to make you aware that this is an outcome of, of the research that we'll be talking about uh, in this panel session. And if you're interested in knowing out more, um, you can contact the Institute directly or you can contact me I'm not on LinkedIn. Um, I'd be delighted to hear from you. So I think that's probably my time. I'm going to hand back to Ella. Thank you very much, Nigel. So it all sounds very busy over in the Institute. So 
could you both give us a little bit of an overview of some of the projects you've been working on recently? You go I can start. Um, so maybe a good example of ethical AI and in fact really AI for good is a recent project we're doing with Blenheim Palace, which um, locals of course will very well know is a famous and beautiful heritage site, where we're looking to use AI to predict and manage the flow of visitors on site. And um, this is a kind of AI project that does not look to create capabilities that replace people. It's really an example of augmenting human capabilities and making the best of people, where um, often in visitor attractions, unhappiness in employees arises when they work in the wrong place at the wrong time, they stand in the rain all day, or they are in the one spot that's super crowded and all the visitors come to them. And our system there is intended to help manage that in a much smarter way to, of course, drive revenue at the site and the community around Blenheim Palace, but also make people working for the site happier employees, which is a very important goal for Blenheim as an organization who wants to become a UK top 100 employer. So we're helping them to achieve that and hopefully in the process also achieve some good societal benefit for the community and around. So I can give an example of, of another project that we're working on, um, uh, which is quite different actually. Uh, so we're working on an Innovate UK funded project with a company called Moorcraft Cross Limited. It's a law firm. Um, and we are helping them to develop uh, a, a legal platform for contract negotiation. And we're using AI as one of as the primary engine underneath this platform. Uh, and the AI uh, is able to analyze uh, written contracts uh, and uh, make the task of reviewing contracts much easier. The idea is that um, this will uh, reduce the length of time that expensive lawyers have to take <laughs> on uh, reviewing contracts, which will make uh, legal oversight more aff affordable uh, for small, particularly smaller organisations. Where if, you know, if you've got anything sort of less than ten thousand pound worth contract, it, it, you know, it, it's it's not worth actually hiring a lawyer to look at. And so there's a lot of legal contracts out there that are being used by businesses that are making them vulnerable because they're getting no legal oversight at all. So the hope is that this tool will help to, to make that legal expertise a bit more accessible. As someone that spends my weekends walking around Blenheim and spends really boring bits of my week looking at contracts, I'm quite excited about both of those things coming, coming out from from your teams, that, that's fantastic. So we've got a selection of questions to get us through kind of the next 45 minutes and then there'll be opportunities um, for anybody in the audience to ask questions. So please do um, put them in the, the chat and the question functions and, and we will happily answer them. Uh, but we've got a few starters uh, here. So this one is a question that we were discussing last week in our prep call, but also has come in from um, one of our attendees today. So it's clearly a hot topic. So there have been a lot of headlines recently about AI inheriting the bias of their creators, whether that's to do with gender or ethnicity. But there's, there's been a lot of news about that. So why does that occur? Shall I start on this one, Matthias, and then you can chip in? Yeah. Um, so uh, there are actually quite a wide range of reasons why this occurs. And, and, and it, there are also a, a broad range of different kinds of bias you can get with an AI system. Um, and I won't go into the, the details of all of them, but typically the, the most common one that we see is what's called representational bias. Um, uh, which means that you don't have enough data about certain groups, usually related to groups of people, um, that you're training your AI on to, for it to form a, 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 an accurate response to the task that it's doing. So take, for example, 
um, CV sifters. I don't know if you're aware that uh, large corporations are using AI programs to sift through thousands of CVs to help them produce a shortlist of which ones they should actually consider for interviewing. Um, now, if you if you have a group of people that that are underrepresented in, in the data that's trained used to train that algorithm uh, then whenever it sees a cv from a represent a member of that group it, it, it it's not got a, a a very strong basis on which to make a decision or a recommendation and that can happen quite easily one of the areas that as an institute we've found uh, which doesn't hit the press actually um, is a minority group that actually is quite significant around the world uh, but is being impacted by exactly that kind of technology and that's people with disabilities. People with disabilities when they're applying for jobs often have um, different CVs that, that, that don't follow a normal format. You know, they may have gaps um, uh, in, their, in their careers and so on uh, and so they appear uh, as an, uh, a kind of outlier to the AI um, and, the, and there aren't enough examples of that kind of CV for the AI system to really know and to understand how to process those correctly and to give an accurate recommendation. And so maybe as an addition to that, I think it's, it's really important um, for AI, like all technical artifacts really, to be critically interrogated uh, first of all by the designers by the people who constructed um, but also to to always manage expectations as to what an ai can really do um, and it is of course not a machine that just magically spits out pure truth it is um, like the question already suggested something that can mirror biases that its creators have that data has um, which is in fact something that is not entirely unique to AI. This is a theme that other technical artifacts can have. A famous example is a soap dispenser that used infrared reflection to detect when someone holds the hand under it that did not work for people of dark skin color because the reflection properties are different and people simply hadn't bothered testing it. So there's another example where it does not require an AI, but it only requires a technological invention um, to reinforce a bias and maybe misconception that its designers had. Yeah, so it's it's not a unique problem that that has just sprung about as AI has come into focus. It it's there, but we're you're right. We all need to look at it a little bit more critically. Um, and do our bit to make sure the information going in is 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 good as well, I guess. So one of the of the topics that we are covering tonight that I know has grabbed lots of people's attention is this idea of moral robots. So Nigel, do you want to explain to me what a moral robot is? I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, uh, a moral robot is. It, in simplest terms, it's a, a robot or a machine in which we try to um, uh, incorporate some degree of moral competence uh, in its decision making processes. So, in other words, we try and uh, find ways of enabling the machine to recognize the ethical and moral impact of, of the decisions and the actions that it's taking. Um, they, one of the challenges uh, that we're facing as, as a society that is being increasingly invaded by this technology at all different kinds of levels is whether or not these machines, robots or, or software algorithms, whether or not they align uh, with our ethics. And this, this has become famously known as the alignment problem. Do the decisions that they make and the actions that they take, do they align with the way we would want them to behave, these machines. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build machines that are capable of aligning themselves with our ethical, moral uh, standards and our societal norms. Fantastic. It sounds like a really big job to 
align, just simply align with morals, which I'm not sure is a very straight line all the time. So yeah, it's uh, certainly a, a big challenge. So we've been maybe a decade away from a lot of autonomous things coming into our lives. I think when I was a kid and I used to watch the Jetsons, I thought we'd all be living on the moon and have a machine that I walked through to, to get me dressed in the morning, but it hasn't quite worked out like that. So really, as experts in the field, how, how far away do you think we are from, from moral robots being part of our everyday lives? I think that's a really hard question. Uh, no one can really answer that. Um, there are certainly still a lot of fundamental research questions that simply need answering. It's not something that we have comprehensively understood even on the peer research side yet how to do, uh, which is part of the reason why we're engaging with it, because there is a lot that still has to be figured out for the uh, societal benefit. But then again, we do have machines already, um, intelligent and unintelligent ones that have an ethical impact on society. And there is a lot of work being done in the direction of responsible engineering as well to make sure that even though machines certainly today and maybe for the foreseeable short term future will not have a true sense of morality, behave morally. And that's a much more tangible short term goal that needs constant reinforcing. And um, I think the, the both the research and the development community is uh, very much aware of that, making good progress in that as well. Fantastic. So once I have once I want to get involved, um, how where do I start? How do you start to build morals into a robot? What's at the top of that to-do list? Yeah, if anybody knows the answer, could they send it in on a postcard, please? <laughs> no, as, as Matthias says, we're still very much working on that. Um, and uh, in fact, there are lots of people working on this. We're not the only ones. Over the last 10 years, this has actually developed into quite um, a broad field of investigation. Um, that's just very briefly there are two broad approaches that people are taking one is what we would call top down um, which is where you try and explicitly encode moral rules or ethical guidance into the robot directly um, and that's being done for example using different kinds of logics that you can you can reason over lots of people are trying out what's called deontic logics, which are um, special logics that um, deal with what our obligations are, help you to reason about what are our moral obligations. So that's kind of a top, top down approach. Um, if anybody's familiar with Asimov's laws um, or of robotics, the three laws, <laughs> um, then that, that is a, an example of a top down approach. You specify three laws, and you explicitly encode them in the robot and the robot's behaving. Challenge with that is nobody really knows how to do that well in a way that integrates properly with the robot itself. And how do you specify rules that take care of every situation that the robot may find itself in? Um, so that we found that that is quite a limited approach. And the other way of doing it is a bottom-up approach, which essentially is the robot learns we enable the robot to learn moral behavior and we can do it in different ways. We can, we can uh, learn, the robot can learn from examples. We can demonstrate good behavior to the robot and we can learn from that. Um, it can learn from instruction being told. It can learn from stories. The most recent work, which is actually very exciting, has taken moral stories of which there are there's a, a many examples of that on the internet that you can use just the text of the stories and you can train a, a, a model that will help a robot to make a, a, a morally appropriate shall we say um, a decision in how it acts and that's one of the lines of inquiry that we're following so bottom bottom up top down uh, in reality i think we need both I think we, we need to give very clear boundaries to robots and find a way of doing that, but we also need them to be able to learn um, uh, 
learn morals and societal, societal norms as they engage with people uh, in, in, our, in, their, in their everyday lives. Fantastic. I would maybe add, add to that um, just as a starting point. Um, it's very important for ethical machines, but also for ethical researchers to make conservatives, uh, sorry, conservative and risk aware choices. And uh, this is a very important topic, in fact, in AI, um, because the good old fashioned AI approaches um, that we have had over decades now. Um, all tend to be a little bit overconfident. That is, this is one of the contributing factors also to biases that an algorithm sometimes doesn't understand that it doesn't know something. And that can have ethical implications. So a, a very important starting consideration is both for the AI part, but also for the human uh, the, the humans conducting the research is to make very conservative choices and small steps towards knowledgeable goals. Fantastic. Okay, so morality is obviously quite a broad subject. So what kind of morals should we be putting into these robots? Good question. Another difficult one to answer. Sorry, Matthias, I jumped in there. Um, I'll say a little bit and then I'll let you chip in. Um, the, the, the problem that we have there is that there's no agreement amongst philosophers which is the best model system to use. Um, uh, the, the, the key ones that come up and which have been people in this area are trying to use to develop moral robots are um, what's called consequentialism where you look at the consequences, the ethical consequences of uh, your actions and use that to make a decision, an ethical decision. Uh, deontology, which is about what your moral obligations are in any given situation. So people are using that kind of a philosophical approach. And then the third one is virtue ethics, where, where your behavior comes out of your virtue, your character, who you are. Uh, and there's some work being done on that, not a great deal. We're, we're doing a little bit uh, on that at Oxford Books at the moment. Um, yeah, so it, it's, there's, there's not broad agreement on it. Um, and so there are different ways of dealing with it. I won't, I won't necessarily go into the details here, but I think I'm going to leave some for Matthias to say. Uh, I can, first of all, fully echo that. I mean, it's uh, on a societal scale still very difficult and philosophically difficult problem. Um, I think the, the technologically first answer deflects from that question a little bit and it's actually the law. The law is the first standard of morals that we apply. Um, now unfortunately that A is a deflection, it, it doesn't answer the actual moral question. Um, and it also makes things complicated in some ways because just like there are different approaches to moral philosophy, the law is different in every country. And this is something that technology companies are already struggling with. Um, but it is the, the first and foremost necessity and um, of course not exactly the same as morality as such, um, but the best and most immediate proxy for it that we have. Can I just sort of just add um, that one of the challenges for us as roboticists is that um, ethical theories tend to take, uh, tend to look at decisions in isolation. Um, so they'll, they'll frame a, a, a dilemma, for example, uh, and they'll uh, try and apply some sort of philosophical approach to how a system, to how you might uh, take one action within that dilemma. But with a, when you're dealing with robots, they take many actions. You know, they, so we have the issue that there are sequences of actions involved in a robot performing a simple thing like going, you know, going to the shop and picking up your shopping. There are lots of things it has to do, lots of decisions it has to make on that on that journey, um, and they they can all have an impact on each other ethically. It can make a decision early on, which has an impact later down. And that's one of the areas that, you know, as, as roboticists, we're struggling to try and match with the philosophical debate. Fantastic. So I think there can be a, a perception that 
robots are made by coders, but to me it sounds like maybe we don't. We need coders and philosophers. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. We need we need uh, input from from both. We need people who are thinking solidly about what it means to be ethical uh, and to and what what it means to to follow societal norms. Um, uh, we need people, we need engineers obviously to build them, uh, but we also need people who understand how to become ethical. Uh, philosophers deal with that to some extent, uh, but, but, but you know, the, there's a challenge there. You might have your preferred ethical system, but you know, how do you become ethical as, an, as, a, as a robot? What's the development phase you have to go through? Um, in humans, it's very complex, and that's where psychology comes in. And other areas that um, that I've looked at, like theology, to to inform how you how you enter a process of becoming ethical, an ethical agent or a moral agent, if you like. And it sounds like with your your legal work, and as Matthias said, law maybe being somewhat of a simplified proxy for for morals. I'm I'm guessing you have a, a lot of legal scholars working alongside you which is fantastic so if you're sat here today and you think i'd like to get into this field i think um, although there is definitely a lack of coders in the world at the moment it seems like actually everybody can bring something to this field which is fascinating so we talked a little bit earlier about storytelling and that being a, a positive tool uh, maybe to teach our robots but one of the most popular stories uh, involving robots is Terminator, uh, that very popular film, which is probably more than 20 years old now, it may even be 30. Um, but obviously, it's not always, he's not always on our side. So how, how realistic is that Terminator outcome? Um. That's a good question, and I'm going to try and choose my words carefully as I as I answer it. Um, if if I could reframe the question slightly, um, it, the, one of the worries that people have about putting moral competence in, into robots is what if they develop the wrong morals? Um, you know, what if they go off the rails? Um, and in fact, we've seen some examples of that, um, haven't we? With um, chatbots online. Microsoft Tay, for example, is a classic one uh, of a chatbot uh, on Twitter that um, was released and within 24 hours or something had to be taken down because it was learning from the tweets that it were being sent to it. But it, it, people, as soon as people realized it was doing that, they started to, to send tweets that would cause it to, you know, be racist and, and you know, and be offensive and, and it just copied them. Uh, so, uh, I think that what this says to me is that we have to be very, very careful in how we approach this, uh, in how we equip robots with moral competence. Um, and I, I, personally, I think that you have to you have to have a very clear. And there's a, there's an engineering side to this. There's a safety aspect to this. You have to have very good protocols for how you evaluate the ethical moral behaviour. Any any machine you develop. Um, whether whether it in, involves explicit morals or not, but you have to be extremely careful, especially if it can learn. And I think we may well see machines that that learn and adapt uh, to our moral and social norms as they go along. And that there has to be safeguards around that. Um, and I think that there are people that are working on that seriously, considering how you can put safeguards on robots that, that are developing. Uh, not just intelligence, but also moral competence. I think that probably dodged the question reasonably well. <laughs> Rathai, yeah, I would you I'm... like to dodge it as well? I will make my own version of that attempt, yes. Um, I think it, it's a great question and it's of course a fantastic movie. It's um, uh, both as a piece of art but also to inspire debates. It's very um, useful and interesting and a good contribution. Um, I think there is the question of AI as such in the movie. 
And of course, the, the movie asks a lot of questions about what we would call general artificial intelligence, essentially this AI that outsmarts everyone and everything. And um, I, I think we're reasonably far away from that, in fact. Um, this is not necessarily a bad thing, even though some people are very worried about possible implications of this. Um, but at any rate, it is not something that is right around the corner. Um, separate, I think, theme that is very important in the movie is what capabilities, what powers do we give those machines, whether they are intelligent or not. And of course, a big danger that comes through in this film is to develop what is commonly called now killer machines in the first place. Whether they are particularly smart or not doesn't necessarily add to this. We have killer machines today and had for many decades actually like landmines, which are banned for good reasons. And in the same way, um, many researchers, and I can align myself with that, think that um, there should be wider measures taken against autonomous killing machines with or without intelligence. And this is, of course, one of the main factors in that hypothetical scenario that leads to disaster, that at some point, maybe designers, maybe the military had the idea to just hand the nuclear codes to an autonomous machine. And this is not, I think, a smart decision as such to give an autonomous machine the power to make such a call without any human intervention. So another very good, very good dodge there. So maybe we are holding hands with the robot and making the decision together, or maybe, um, a robot has made the decision. Do you think that robots should be or would be held responsible for their actions? Again, a big question. Yeah, um, you know, that is a big question. Um, well, I mean, I, personally, I don't think they ever should. <laughs> um, but you can understand why it might be an area of concern because you are you are we are attempting to equip them with some moral competence and if we equip them with moral competence does that mean that when they make moral decisions um that they are culpable i don't i don't think we should ever be put ourselves in a position where that is the case um i think that um that, very best robots should be treated as children <laughs> at very best um, uh, in, in the sense that they have limited capacity to do things uh, and but they also that someone has oversight over them moral oversight over them and responsibility for them i don't think we should ever get to the point where a robot is responsible for it itself its own development and its own um behavior i think that 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 could be a, a road to some unpleasant stuff happening uh, but you know i think that we should always have a human uh who is responsible for the behavior and the development of any machine i fully agree with that um i think as again as a technological artifact it is first of all the designer's responsibility and duty to ensure that everything is safe and sound. Uh, there may be societal discussions that go towards intermediate, um, I think, uh, legal statuses of AIs very much um, in the direction of, let's say, a pet, who, uh, which is um, not a pet cannot be brought to court. It is the owner of the pet that is brought to court, but still has a intermediate kind of also legal status and moral status in the sense of um, an entity that can learn and adapt guided by its owner. Um, but for example, also has uh, pets have the right uh, not to be harmed. And uh, this is something that 
is discussed not only by technologists, um, but also on a societal and legal level in some countries. This is not so necessarily something that I think is desirable as a status, but it's certainly something that is considered by some and is a very active debate. Fascinating. Okay, so we've mentioned robots as people, as Terminator, good or bad. We've mentioned robots as so should we anthropomorphize, humanize robots? I think we can't help ourselves to some extent. It's a human quality to project aspects of humanity into all kinds of things. Um, this is something that comes very natural to people who get angry with their computer or get angry with their car and think they have something against them. And it is something that is inherent in the way we deal with things and we make sense of things. Um, but it is also something that um, has positive and negative potential ethical implications. It can be something that um, can be I think heartwarming in, in the same way that people develop um, 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 appreciation with a toy that's that they have a very fun, even on a conscious relation that they have an attachment to it uh, but it's also something that can be exploited and that is something that is uh, i think very important in the, in the field of ethical and applying ai in a responsible way that this bit of trust that people project on things is not exploited. An example of that is chatbots on the phone, which give very convincing impressions of talking to a person where in fact you're not. And this is something that's um, from an ethical point of view quite contentious, even though it's something that is already being applied. Um, but there is something, there, there's a, a big discussion about pretending and projecting these kind of things in a, in a kind of false and potentially misleading way and that's a very important thing for AIs as well as robots to get right and in the design and be responsible with. Yeah, I, I align myself with everything that uh, you say Mateus. I think that I'll just add that, the, you know, just to, to say that there is commercial um, benefit to making robots human-like. Because as, as Matthias says, we're kind of drawn to our own image. Uh, and, uh, you know, and the manufacturers of robots are aware of this. And, and some of them invest quite a lot of time and resource in making their robots look human-like enough to uh, maximize their appeal, but not too human-like, that they become uh, freaky and, and, and puts people off. The other thing that I would say is that um, the danger of anthropomorphism, um, especially from the moral point of view, is that what we tend to do is when we see something that looks human-like, we endow it not just with a visual sort of uh, human features, but we tend to think that that robot has competencies that are human-like as well. You know, it has the shape of a, of a human, it sounds like a human, it's talking like a human, it's moving like a human. So surely it's, it's got the competences that a human has, which includes moral competence and moral awareness. Um, and most of them, in fact, probably all of them at this stage don't. So the danger of anthropomorphism is that we lead people on. I think this is emphasizing something that Matthias is already saying. We lead people on in a way uh, that these robots have have abilities that they don't have, and that, that, is, uh, that is a danger. Fascinating. Everything seems to be quite a simple question, and then it has many, many layers to it, um, which is, yeah, again, really fascinating. And we're so lucky to have you, you here sharing that with us. Um, so one of the reasons we're not all sat in John Henry Brooks today, sat next to each other, is because we are coming hopefully uh, certainly in the uk to the end of the covid19 pandemic it's it's changed 
everything um, that we've done in the last year. And, and we've all had more moral dilemmas than, than we're used to, I think, whether protecting the vulnerable versus locking people inside, just what does that do to mental health, protecting teachers versus the long-term educational prospects of kids. It's, it's been a moral quandary of, of a time period to live through, I think we can, we can all say that. So how's AI played a role in, in the pandemic and the pandemic response? I think it has played a very concrete role in, in many different capacities, in fact. Um, an example I can um, explain maybe is the project with Lennon Palace again, where um, this is uh, something that happened very recently, the lights trail, the Christmas lights trail again, some of you um, listening may have been there this Christmas, um, has been of course, under these circumstances, a very difficult to manage um, event with many people coming into a site. And COVID safety, of course, was a major concern in that. And our models and our sensors there, in fact, help to make the right planning decisions and keep things flowing, no major congestions on the site, um, and thereby help to bring a lot of people to this beautiful site and get out into the fresh air, which of course is very important and it was very specifically desired by the government also that people can also enjoy their lives while not being overcrowded at any point in time and everyone could stay covered safe. Yeah, I think that's a good example, it's a very good practical example. But I, they, there's quite a lot of uh, aspects of how we've had to adjust to new life under the uh pandemic that ai has helped with and that includes you know a range of things like uh helping with uh screening and, and tracking uh, the progress of the disease as it spreads and predictions of how it's spreading it's one of the things that matthias and i have done started to do a little bit of work on is predicting how local uh, incidents can spread geographically and over time um, but it's also helped with the development of drugs and vaccines, you know, so you know, there's, there's been, AI has played quite a big role, I think, in enabling us to respond quickly and effectively um, to this particular pandemic. Fantastic, because so much of what we've talked about this evening feels very far ahead in the future, very big questions, but it, it's really great to know that it's happening here and now and it and it's played a, a positive role in in what we're what we're doing so i think to sort of come to the end here and please do put your questions in in the chat uh, there's questions functions and chat functions we can see here so if anybody's got a question please do do throw it in there and we'll try and try and get to it but i think man versus machine is maybe something that is a common rhetoric but actually it sounds like from all these discussions that we maybe should be thinking about man and machine together yeah i i, I mean i absolutely agree with that and i think that um one of the um one of the ways to to get the best out of both ourselves and ai is is, is to see it as a collaboration to see artificial intelligence as augmented intelligence, augmenting human capacities. Um, we had, uh, so about five years ago, we had a conference at Brooks and uh, we had Gary Kasparov come and give, um, uh, amazingly managed to, to land him to come and speak. And one of the things that he talked about, some of the work that he's done since being beaten by Deep Blue, <laughs> way back in whenever it was, uh, in the nineties, I think it was, wasn't it? Um, uh, so his perspective was that um, machine plus human outperforms machine alone or human alone. Um, and he's got evidence to show that through various competitions that they've held with uh, in, in the chess world. Um, but I think it does apply broadly to how we integrate AI into our, the social fabric of our world. You know, it becomes part of our everyday life, it becomes part of how we interact with each other and uh, how we interact with data and all that kind of stuff. And I think that, that seeing it as an augmentation rather than 
uh, you know, uh, one versus the other is probably the way to go. I completely agree. This is something that I think in the end, if it's well done, and uh, I think there are many good examples for that, it leads to um, simply not people having an antagonist, by, but by having better lives, by having more capabilities, uh, more enjoyable activities as well on their side. Well, for example, dull tasks, dangerous tasks can be maybe automated, uh, which is a very common theme, um, but also giving them generally more senses and capabilities that simply without we wouldn't have and that make our lives more productive or more rich or more enjoyable. Fantastic. So we've got loads of questions coming in, which shows what a fascinating subject it is. Which so first one is clearly we've convinced everybody AI is going to be a, a big part of our lives in future. So what can young people do to get involved in the field right now? Well, that's a really good question and an important one as well, because we we need we need people who think you know, at an early stage in their in their development of career, what AI is about, and to understand it, uh, and to understand what the moral implications of it are. Um, I think my my advice will be to try and engage their imagination and their passion for it. I mean, films are a great way of doing that, right? Storytelling uh, is a great way of engaging young people's minds on the challenges that we face today. And I think AI is is one of the biggest challenges we're facing, how AI develops and how it integrates with our society and how we how we manage it in the future is, is one of the great challenges that we face. So engaging young people in that early on, uh, getting them to study the subject and to equip themselves with all sorts of different skills, as we saw earlier, not just the technical stuff. Um, technical stuff is very interesting and very necessary, obviously, uh, but also, you know, the social sciences, we need people in the social sciences who are aware of AI um, and, you know, who can help us understand and predict uh, and manage the consequences of the technology. Fascinating. Okay. So, I'm fully aware of the time. So, this is a question uh, from the audience. Would you advocate for legislation towards ethical robots in terms of, kind of regulating the build of them? Matthias, do you want to take that on first? Or? And it's a, a tricky question because it relies quite a bit on what we mean by each of these terms and, and the, the word that would actually be written in that law. I think the, partially the answer is we have laws, of course, that govern a lot of safety requirements, um, anti-discrimination laws, and a, a lot of ground is actually covered. So it is not that AI is entirely an unregulated, unlegislated field. That's not where we are. They're, they're already just as machines and computer programs, very tightly regulated. Um, um, personally, I wouldn't um, give a verdict on, we, on whether we would need a specialized law of governing ethical machines because we don't really have a common agreed sense what that exactly would entail. Um, but I think that's a very important legal debate, what we would actually consider uh, to be such, what such an entity would actually be and when we would start counting something as an ethical machine. It's a great question. Yeah, it, it is a great question. I'm not sure that I can say any any more than what Matthias has already said. I mean, I think that the, there is a role for legislation in the development of this technology as, as in any technology, um, but it has to be carefully um laid down because you know at one extreme you could just stifle the development of the subject you know the uk is internationally recognized as being you know a a, a, a place of expertise and, and particular competence with ai um, and we wouldn't want to that to be um limited or quashed but on on the one hand but on the other hand we don't, we don't you know we 
there has to be some legal oversight to what is going on and how these machines are being developed, especially if they're going to have an impact on people in everyday lives. So I can see a role ultimately for some kind of licensing, maybe. Um, I don't know. Uh, it, it's a, a really difficult one, but it is one that is, we need people to understand it. We need lawyers that can really understand the technology and, and its impact on people um, to, uh, you know, help us with answering that question ourselves. Okay. So we've got another one coming. With the rise of self-driving cars on the road, Tesla Autopilot, or closer to home, we've got Oxbotica rom roaming the streets of, of our city. These are likely to be the first human AI interfaces in the hands of the masses. So what do you both see happening in terms of road safety ethics for self-driving cars? I think that that's a really that's a really good question and I think it, it's I think the technology is in terms of actually managing the vehicle's movement on the road I think we're quite close to that that being almost ready to go live um, but I think the issue that we haven't really tackled and one that really interests me is we haven't really got to the bottom of the fact that the road is a social space um, that other road users, road users interact with each other in, in specific kinds of ways, which enable uh, us to, to kind of get along as we get from A to B, going along, our, going along the road, we, we see other road users, we, we give way to them, um, there are expectations on us as a road user and we have expectations on other people. Um, so I think that, you know, I think it is, Technologically, we're not far off the deliver, you know, that, that kind of thing happening uh, and becoming a, a sort of a more regular occurrence in our everyday lives. But I think we still have a way to go to understanding how humans behave on roads. <laughs> uh, and a machine needs to understand that and needs to be able to anticipate how other road users are going to behave. People, even people walking along the pavement, you know, coming out in front of a car, can you? anticipate that and that's a non-trivial problem actually it's one of the ones that we're looking at as a university it's one of the areas of research that we're doing in, in autonomous vehicles um, so that kind of that at that level i feel that we've got a way to go can we put a car on the, a road that's that drives safely i think we i think that's within reach i think that's doable but um you know i'm not sure that i'd want it to happen until we'd sorted out the issue of other non-autonomous vehicles on the road and, and other users of the road, uh, you know, being able to adapt to them and, and, you know, there needs to be some kind of phased introduction or something enables people to adjust to the fact that an autonomous vehicle is there. I mean, I don't know if you're aware that in, in the States, for example, um, in some areas, people jump out deliberately in front of autonomous vehicles um, because they know they'll stop, you know, so there are behaviours are being created around this technology. Um, we need to understand that and we need to be able to factor that in. Okay, so another good question coming in here. As an AI consulting services partner, sometimes it's very difficult to convince clients to use AI ethically when they're trying to solve a very specific problem that may not be ethically right. What would you recommend to a service provider in such a scenario. Do you want me to take that, Matthias, or do you want to take it? Yeah, I'm not quite sure where the question precisely goes. Um, I think the general recommendation um, would be to, first of all, en engage with the process. Right? This is not usually black and white, but it is a process like all design and engineering tasks. Um, that involves testing and uh, consideration of the risks and oftentimes risks can be very sensibly mitigated and managed but only once they are on the table once it's become part of the process so i do not think that um, the worry to do something wrong is something that should just stop people uh, and prevent them from engaging with the topic it is rather the 
the ongoing process of figuring out what potential risks actually are. And then sometimes the answer is maybe that the risks are too large, and that's an important point where you will want to stop. But it is, I think, worth engaging with the question a little bit deeper and actually figuring out what those risks could be. Yeah, um, that, and that's precisely what we're doing in the Institute for Ethical AI. Uh, um, we're, we are developing an um, evaluation platform, a systematic way of evaluating products and helping, helping people to understand and explore what are the consequences of ad adopting this technology in my business. What risks am I taking on, on board? Um, but also, you know, how can we mitigate those risks whilst also maintaining the advantage um, that the AI brings? So that's really important. Um, and it, it, it is a piece of work that we're taking very, very seriously. Okay, this is going to have to be our final, final question, I'm afraid. Um, we're not going to get to all of you, um, but as uh, Nigel said at the start, I'm sure if any of you wanted to bring this conversation on afterwards, um, you, can, you can get in touch via the Institute or via LinkedIn. Um, so our final question is, is coming back to the great work um, during the pandemic, what do you foresee being the next biggest medical uses of, of AI in the in the near future? Okay, um, I could probably start on this one. Um, so I think that, uh, so the, one of the most exciting developments in AI in recent years has been in natural language processing. Um, and uh, in particular, using this technology called deep learning, uh, which people have heard the words, they may not necessarily understand what it means, it doesn't really matter, but um, the, 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 the ability of machines to read and understand written text ha has been totally transformed in the last three years uh, by the development of these very large AI systems, they're called language models. Um, you may be, some people might be familiar with GPT-3 um, or with uh, a system called BERT. If, you, if you're not, look it up. It, this is really interesting. And essentially these models are trained on huge amounts of text. I mean, phenomenal amounts of text. Um, GPT-3 has been trained on the whole of the internet. Plus, you know, all the text, imagine all the text on the internet. <laughs> You know, this algorithm has been trained on all of that, and it's been, and in that process, it's learnt, it's learnt how to uh, analyse English language and to answer questions about English language. Now, um, what we're interested in, and what other people are interested in, is how can you apply that to health care? Um, for example, there's a lot of information uh, uh, that, that's written about patients, you know, in a, in a in a, in a doctor's practice, for example, you can deploy AI, uh, natural language processing, to analyze that text. Um, and then you can learn from that. You can learn from many, many um, documents that are written about the health care and the treatment of individuals. You can learn what works and what doesn't work. You can learn to predict uh, which, uh, uh, what the, the likely course of a patient's health condition is over a period of time, what the likely diseases they might get and so on. You know, so to me, that is the most, one of the most exciting opportunities that we have in, in sort of healthcare type applications of AI is the use of natural language, modern, powerful natural language processing techniques that will give us insights into how, how, we, uh, how we treat people, how we manage people with uh, different diseases that we would never have had previously. So maybe just as a completely complementary example, a um, recent project finished, um, led by Oxford Brookes University, was on helping diabetes patients self-manage in a smart way. And uh, this is something that is at the complete other end, which is not about taking large amounts of data and making sense of it is actually making more sense of the individual and helping individuals manage themselves um, in a health context where um, AI has a lot of interesting applications and potential. Uh, I think 
this is um, in particular in healthcare, which is such a broad, diverse sector in itself, um, full of potential uh, for all kinds of application of AI. And I think uh, we're just at the beginning, really, of seeing that fully coming through. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for your questions. I'm really sorry we can't get through all of them. Some are really big ones as well. Um, so yeah, please, please continue those conversations um, outside of outside of this. It sounds like there's still a lot to talk about. Um, so on behalf of the Oxford chapter, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. And particularly thank you to Nigel and Matthias for sharing uh, their amazing amount of expertise on a fascinating subject with us so thank you very much thank you and the final Pleasure. thank you thank you as well for chairing it's been a really Pleasure. interesting Pleasure. event thank you thank you from the alumni team to uh nigel Mateus, and to ella and uh tune into the next event hey on the on the 7th of june that we're running okay have a great evening and that's been it's been a really interesting evening um i hope um it's been a lots of Fodder, lots of in, information to take forward and think about. And um, the next event would be the 7th of June, which is around mutual aid in Oxfordshire. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and we also have another event tomorrow, Inspirational Journeys by Jenny Okolo, who's um, tomorrow one of our alumni, who's actually giving us a talk about um, combining a career and being an entrepreneur. So um, tune into that as well. Okay. Thank you very much.